Thank you. Uh, this is not so much a, a, a piece of research as, uh, as an opinion piece, uh, and it's based on um, my, my experience and my interest and passion about the impact of uh, communications technologies on society. And today I want to reflect on how digital consumer technologies and the consumerization of these is having an impact on culture, heritage and tourism. Um, and to make the point at the beginning that it's my firm belief that it's our ability as human beings to be able to communicate across space and time, which shapes civilization uh, over the, the millennia and has impacted our culture and heritage uh, today. But we live in a society and, and it's a period in time which has really been unprecedented. Um, I've been fortunate enough in many ways to live through this period of time where we've seen the consumerization or the democratization of digital communications technologies. And this is having a very disruptive influence on the future of civilization and particularly uh, culture and, and heritage. Um, and it's in the re my presentation really has been targeted really at three different types of people, people like myself who are baby boomers. I was born just after the Second World War. Um, they will be, I'd be able to identify, I think, with a lot of the, the changes that I'm going to reflect on. But also it's important uh, that the next generation have an understanding and appreciation of history because they're born into a world where these technologies exist and they become part of their daily lives. Uh, and because they haven't lived through the, the, the period in history that I've lived through and that my previous generations have lived through, it's difficult, I think, for them to, to conceive what life was like um, as a child when I was growing up um, and my lifetime. And finally, futurologists or people who are interested in shaping the way in which technology um, affects our future. Now... The ability and the need to communicate, I believe, is, is embedded in our DNA, not just our DNA, but also the DNA of all living creatures. It's how evolution operates. And human beings use the power of communication technologies to overcome the physical limitations and the barriers of space and time. And I'm going to show you how this has evolved over time. Uh, we have a particular challenge in the 21st century. Uh, because we've evolved over a period of time from analog communications to digital. Um, and the quantum change that digital communications technologies take place has really happened within a generation and less than 0.01% of human history. So we're seeing just really transformative changes in a small period of time. And the way in which communication has affected civilization. Um, you see, it starts with um, intelligence uh, plus language and location. These are the foundations of our culture and our heritage. And in the beginning, um, we had tribal communities who really didn't uh, communicate very much with each other. And so most people's lives were spent living in the same kind of space and listening to the stories of previous generations. Um, and that led over time, as uh, communications technologies improved, to uh, the evolution of empires and dynasties. And these things happen over increasingly short time spells. So in the beginning, and um, this is where I want to reflect on two main types of communication. In the beginning, synchronous communication took the form of uh, gatherings of people together. You can see people uh, in, in cave dwellers talking to uh, each other and communicating. Um, and that's a form of synchronous communication. Uh, but they also left a legacy um, uh, which uses asynchronous communication to deliver their experience over time. So as we look at these cave paintings, which are 10,000 years old, we are influenced in maybe very small ways by what we are seeing. So what happened 10,000 years ago um, is having an impact, albeit very small, uh, on life today. And so as communications technologies evolve and civilization evolve, uh, it still relied upon synchronous communication, people getting together, the forums in Rome, et cetera, passing 
uh, law and knowledge and um, uh, to to the future generations and asynchronous communications uh, we we can now decipher the hieroglyphs of egyptian um, dynasties and understand what life was like for them so it's this mixture of synchronous and asynchronous communications which is shaping the way we live synchronous communications are great for building relationships they're great for shaping opinions and calls to action and they take place mostly in the same space and time as we are uh, involved in this webinar today, we are all in the same space and time, albeit with small numbers today. But the, there is a challenge with synchronous communications because um, without technology, human beings are constrained by the physical limitations uh, of restricted time and space. And so you see that this young boy uh, shouting. Um, uh, and asynchronous communications, they overcome the barrier of time and space because they are a legacy for future generations, but they are quite limited um, in building human relations because they haven't got this uh, in, uh, interaction between human beings. So we've overcome these barriers of space and time in different ways. Uh, and because we, our ability to hear over distance is limited, we develop things like um, these beacons um, and, and semaphore as a way of communicating over longer distances. Today, uh, we use this combination of synchronous and asynchronous communication, and that's shaping our cultural heritage. And, and so uh, through this mixture of synchronous and asynchronous communication, we transfer our knowledge. And this is transferred uh, not just within a physical space, but it's also transferred, uh, transferring knowledge from previous generations. So the key developments in history which have shaped culture and heritage, are, in my opinion anyway, all revolve around improvements and quantum leaps in communication technology from the Roman roads, which led um, and was a very important factor uh, in uh, the, the Roman Empire, uh, the printing press and the ability to reproduce printed documents um, and make those available to mass audience also had a significant impact on culture and heritage. And of course, as time has evolved, we've got to mass communications involve, uh, involving newspapers and forms of transport, which allow people to have additional mobility, to be able to share their ideas and their culture and heritage with people in different locations. Uh, and we've always used ingenuity to overcome uh, <laughs> these kinds of barriers, barriers. I'll show a simple thing that we used to use the kids at two tin cans linked together with a piece of string as a way of communicating over, over distance. So a few of the technologies which have evolved to overcome these barriers, we've had telegraphy in 1816, uh, we've had Marconi and radio in 1897, uh, and all of these uh, increase our ability to uh, communicate over uh, significant distances. And then we have the mass communications of the, uh, the, the cinema. Um, and this is a mixture of asynchronous and communication and synchronous communication because people watch movies together. Um, and these kinds of uh, technologies were controlled by media moguls, either newspaper owners or um, owners of um, cinematic uh, companies. But during my lifetime, particularly, uh, but slightly before that, we've seen the consumerization of these technologies, whereby uh, these technologies are accessible to everyone. Um, and that brings with it consumer choice and control. Um, and it was 1992 with the advent of the internet and digital communications. And this seen an exponential development in the kind of technologies that empower consumer businesses to harness these technologies. And it provided a, a revolution in both synchronous and asynchronous communication. And what I want to talk about now is the disruptive consumer technologies that shape uh, culture, heritage, and tourism. So when we look at synchronous communications, in my lifetime, we've evolved from this uh, mobile phone that looked like a brick, 
uh, which was only used for, for telephone calls, into smartphones where we can not only um, communicate by voice, not just to one person, but to many people, but, but also by, by, by video uh, to large numbers of people. So synchronous communications have evolved in my lifetime are basically one-to-one -one communications, so speech and uh, text chat, et cetera, to one-to-many communications and the advent of video conferencing, um, to many-to-many -to -many communications. And we've seen the uh, emergence of the metaverse as a new, a new phenomenon. So citizens have unprecedented, unprecedented access to global communications in real time and on demand. So we're going from, in the beginning, many to many speech, video and text in 2010 to now many to many consumer live video with creative tools that help to enhance the message that we're able to communicate. On the asynchronous communications uh, front, we've, we've also seen major improvements in the, the asynchronous tools that we use for books and text, photographs and images and, and, and videos. Um, showing a little uh, video clip there. There's a familiar sight along the highway. I'll skip through that because uh, in the interest of uh, time, uh, asynchronous communication with text, we've gone from word processors to uh, iBooks. Uh, we've gone from photographs and early digital photography. This is a picture of myself with my step-granddaughter. Um, and that was taken in 1991 with um, uh, a forerunner of the uh, digital camera, which in those days was still an analog camera as a Canon ion. Uh, to now, this is accessible to everyone with a smartphone through selfies and uh, Instagram. And we've also gone in from uh, with asynchronous communication for video from DVD as a medium in the 1990s to streaming video, which is not just ordinary video, but it can be 360 degree video. So we can have uh, experiences within a totally realistic virtual reality environment. It isn't just people in. So um, I was privileged enough to speak at a recent Eurasia conference um, in Antalya. Um, and for me, it was a wonderful opportunity to meet people face to face, uh, build relationships with them. Uh, but as I was meeting with the delegates at this conference um, in Antalya, uh, I was also streaming that live um, via uh, by YouTube and, and Facebook uh, to a larger audience and hopefully sharing uh, my thoughts and experience with, with a wide, wider audience. So what does this mean for humanity? Um, well, we're living in a time of exponential change. Uh, we're living in a time where tomorrow will not be the same as today. Um, and we're living in a time where uh, events can have almost global impact. Every morning I, I look at the BBC website to hear the latest news, what's happening in the Ukraine and in different parts of the world. Um, and these communications are going out to millions and millions of people simultaneously. Uh, but with this consumerization, uh, we, what we're seeing is a disconnect, I believe, between power and responsibility. Uh, just because we have the power to communicate to a global audience, it doesn't mean that we have responsibility for um, what that communication means. Um, and I'm going to show some examples of this. And in my view, it's leading to a polarized society. And this is one of the biggest uh, challenges that we face. Um, and in fact, it may lead to um, uh, challenges to the sustainability of the human race. So now we're, we're seeing some examples of how consumer digital technologies are having an impact around the world. And so these are uh, not recent pictures, but uh, you're probably familiar with the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, an event that happened in the USA, uh, spawned a group of individuals who are not uh, political leaders. Um, they were ordinary individuals, but they used the power of uh, technology to have an impact all around the world to make a case for um, uh, against racism um, and a case for equality. We, we have um, environmentalists like this young lady who's had an impact 
through the use of technology. And in the UK, we have our uh, royal celebrities, uh, Prince Harry and, and Meghan, um, who, because of their, their connection with Netflix and their, their ability to manipulate the media, um, they are having a major impact for, for good or evil uh, on the rest of society. And ordinary people, um, particularly social influencers, and this is what I meant to uh, show, social influencers, um, whether good or bad, they, they can influence millions of people by their thoughts and their daily actions without any kind of responsibility for the impact of that. So what we're seeing now and in the future is that these communications will get richer, they'll get faster, they'll get more personalised, more global and more intelligent. So when I give out a, a message, um, if you're looking at Facebook or any of these other media, the use of artificial intelligence to direct my message to people who might be interested um, in my message is shaping opinion in really a what I think is a distorted way. And now, of course, we have the metaverse, and, and this is, metaverse is not new. This is actually a picture of my avatar um, in Red Square, um, and this was shot in 2007 um, using the metaverse Second Life. Uh, now, metaverse is receiving a lot of traction and attention and investment, and it'd be interesting to see what impact that will have. So, when we look at the big picture of how communications has affect, uh, impacted civilization, we are moving to an era where um, our intelligence is un unconstrained by language, space, or time. Uh, we, we can uh, reach out to future generations. We can reach out whatever language we have uh, with all of the technologies that do instant translation, etc. cetera. Um, and so what, is the likely impact of that. What could go wrong? Uh, well, there's a lot that could go wrong. And I, in my own mind, I use this analogy, an analogy of um, uh, nuclear power. Um, the atom was split in 1945 and we saw the atomic bomb, uh, but the same kind of uh, technology can be used to provide power, uh, heat and lighting, um, and our communication. So we have this piece of technology and it's based uh, on um, increasing activity of atoms colliding with each other uh, and being able to um, basically uh, overcome uh, physical constraints of, of, of space. And if we're able to harness that, we can um, uh, improve the world. But in a way, our communications technology is analogous to what's happening inside a nuclear reactor. And we have all of these events and activities which are being increasingly reaching huge audiences without any real knowledge of the impact of that. Uh, and if we don't know how to manage that, we risk the danger of threatening the future of the human race. I just want to touch briefly on the impact of COVID-19. And in a way, COVID-19, in my opinion, uh, although it's been a terrible uh, human uh, disaster, uh, it also may be given us a chance to reflect on the way we live and change the way we live for, for the future. Um, and so um, what we've seen is the increase in online meetings. We've seen deserted town centers, which are now filling up again. We've seen grounded aircraft. Um, but all of these things may well, uh, by disrupting uh, the, the, the potential of, of, of at least mobile communications technology uh, to affect the future. And so we've also seen online shopping, meal deliveries, and community initiatives have, in, in particular, uh, I've observed in, in COVID-19, um, have really helped to bring communities together and bring that sense of cultural identity, which was beginning to be lost in my lifetime. So communities are more aware of their neighbors now, and they're more working uh, 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 together. And hopefully that will be retained. So the things to, I think, think about uh, for the future is the 
exponent the change the effect of exponential change on human life we've gone through changes that we've never had to go through before and we don't really know what the outcome of those changes are a consumerization of digital technologies and the use of artificial intelligence is going to have a big impact on who can influence whom um, and in the uk we we have seen the emergence of what we call the woke culture uh, where groups of people are trying to destroy uh, their heritage and the past um, be because uh, tearing down statues of people who were who uh, made their fortunes in slavery, for example, trying to remove bits of history from um, uh, literature uh, because they don't agree with the opinions. Um, so all of these things are not necessarily good for the future of, of societies. And I think COVID-19 is an opportunity that we need to uh, take. Uh, and we also need to realise that we need to balance the needs of us as individuals to communicate and feel that we have some control of our lives um, and those of, of society. Um, that really concludes my presentation. I hope you found it interesting and um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Workley, for this, this presentation, a very, very interesting presentation, a very interesting topic. I have a question. Do you have realized a previous study on this topic in the past related to this topic? Um, well, I've been, I've been interested in it for a long period, but I, I, I haven't done any scientific research in the way Maria has done with, with, um, with her previous uh, presentation, because I am not by nature a researcher. I have done research in the past, but um, I, haven't, um, I haven't looked at that. What I did do, though, um, is write a book um, uh, which really charts um, the changes in technology over my lifetime from a it's it's an autobiographical account so it looks at different kinds of technologies and how artificial intelligence has come to play a role in all of them it's a book called gadgets to god uh, it's not meant to be a religious book at all but it's meant to make the point that during my lifetime i've seen the the evolution of technology but from being a gadget which helps us in our everyday life, it helps us to do things that we otherwise would not be able to do physically or mentally. And these technologies in my early life were, were all gadgets, whether they were slide rules or whether a desktop calculator, they were gadgets. Now we have uh, technology with artificial intelligence, which if you look at it in, 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 in this way, uh, really, we, we have created God in our own likeness because we spend all our time communing with uh, not, not God as we did in the past. We rely on Facebook and, and Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, we spend all our time communing with our phone. And we, in a way, we think all of the attributes that you, you can ascribe to technology today, in other words, the cloud technology, it's all seeing, it's all knowing, it's looking at what we're doing every minute of the day, it's communicating with us, it's listening to us. Um, all of these things are what people ascribe to their, their God, the characteristics of God. Um, and so that's why I call it gadgets to God. Um, and it, I think it's something that we we need to be very conscious of. Uh, I'm not sure what kind of research you could do to validate that. You could certainly do research on the impact of technology on, on individual areas like communication, transport, and what have you, but um, whether you can do it to incorporate human emotions and culture and, and heritage and opinions, uh, um, I, I, I don't really know how a research project would, would work. Thank you. Uh, and con congratulations again for this uh, presentation, for the topic which you have talked about. Thank you. Uh, 